You all can be seated. If I can have uh, those that are helping with get the illustration set up for later, if you guys want to go ahead and get that in place. I realize I think some of us are still traumatized because some of you, when you walk in and you saw the ladder and the scaffolding, you went, what's wrong? Because <laughs> if you were part of the remodel process, um, you know that we had some leaks, some water at the old church. Um, one week, I, can we turn it that way? Thanks, guys. Um, and if you want to bring it right back up against here, because we're going to put the, the pulpit in front of it. Thank you. At the, at the old church, um, I think it was a week or two after we had sold the property and ownership had switched hands. Um, I don't remember what the, the main part of the message was, but I, the scripture passage I spoke on was, was Noah's Ark. And literally the next Sunday, we had to cancel church because it was like the flood in the church building again because water lines broke and all that. So now when people see scaffolding or, trash, or a trash can in the middle of the floor, a ladder, anything, it's automatically like traumatizing. It's like, oh no, what's, what's happening? So as they're getting that set up, I just want to, just a couple things we have coming up. Um, this week, uh, pay attention if you're on, if you follow us on social media. Uh, if not, we'll be emailing or texting it out. I'm gonna go ahead and come down here so people over here can see me as well. Um, we'll be sending a text and an email out with a link. Because um, again, how many of you guys, you've had your life impacted in some way, shape, or form over the last couple of weeks of the revival? I think everybody in this room, if you've been there, would say yes. So we're going to send a link out uh, that you guys can uh, share what God has done in your life, share the testimony, and then tell us whether or not we can share that on social media, share it here in the services, because we want people to know what God is doing. Scripture is clear in Revelation 12, 11, that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and what? The word of the testimony. They're pros at this, guys. You do, some of you are looking at them. They're, they're pros. I'm the one you got to worry about if I actually decide to climb that thing. Um, don't be fine. I, I did not dress uh, to be on scaffolding. So, uh, but we want you guys to, when you get that link, fill that out. Um, we had some awesome stuff going on this week. How many of you have heard us talk about LifeWise? Uh, if you don't know what LifeWise is, just in a nutshell, that's when students are able to be released during non-instruction, uh, non-core instruction time uh, during the school day to be released uh, as long as it's uh, off school property, privately funded, and they have the permission of the parents, they can be released to receive Bible instruction uh, during the school day. This last week here in Perkins, it started on Tuesdays. Uh, Meadow Lawn is at uh, Faith Church, and on Thursdays, Furry Elementary School is here. I know between the two schools, there were 125 students that participated this week. Come on. Now, you can stand for that, amen. But here's the thing. Students are, was it students or teachers that said they needed more forms? Students are like, I need more, uh, more forms because I've got like 14 of my friends that are going to sign up because students are going back and telling their friends. And they're like, well, I want to go too. And as I was thinking, it was, I think it was Thursday morning, um, as I was praying and working on some stuff for today, I was thinking about the students that were going to be in this building. And it hit me. I said, you know, it's not an accident. Yeah, don't put it too far up, man. That's plenty. That's... <laughs> You only live once, just go for it. <laughs> My heart's already starting to speed up. <laughs> the things you do to, to, to make a point in a sermon. But I was thinking on Thursday, I said, you know, it's not an accident that the school students are going to be in this church in the middle of a revival. And my prayer quickly became, God, as they enter... May the, the, the fire of revival, even the breadcrumbs that are still in the building from last week and the week before, as they come in, may they get on them and they take it back to their students and their, and, and their parents and whoever they're in contact with. It's not an accident that it started the same week that we're in the middle of revival. And here's the awesome thing. There was a student in this building on Thursday. Um, he didn't know how to pray. He didn't know who God was. And volunteers got to have that instruction or got to have that, that conversation with him and explain to him who God was, why we pray. That happened in this church with a public school student. Can you say amen today? I love what God is doing. I love it. And just uh, one more thing to, to mark your calendars for. Um, October 22nd, I know... 
I'm not exactly sure what they have planned. I know they're doing something. At least they tell me they're doing something with Pastor Appreciation today. On October 22nd, um, since the month of October is Pastor Appreciation Month, um, I'm going to be recognizing... Um, I mean, we, we have different levels of staff here. We have team leads, we have staff. We also have what we would call pastoral or ministerial level positions. So on October 22nd, I'm gonna be recognizing some of our, what we would call pastoral level uh, leaders here with, with our youth pastor, our worship leaders, our kids director as well. And then also, this is exciting, um, on that same day, we are gonna be ordaining Pastor Seth. Give him a hand clap this morning. How many of you are thankful for the team of leaders we have here, amen? I know I'm excited. I know many times I hear people say, we're so excited, we're so appreciative of what is going on here at New Life. Listen, I cannot do what I do without the team. We cannot do what uh, we do without the volunteers. That's what the Fiesta is about, just as a fun way to, to recognize you all. Yeah, we, yeah, I'm not climbing it without that thing, man. <laughs> no way. I'll be, I'll be hanging from the, uh, not doing that. That's fine. I'll go for it. I'll go for it. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and bring this down so we can get started with the story. All right. How many of you are ready for the word today? All right. Hey Amen. I'm a little scared of <laughs> something falls. I, I got to tell you a quick story, and then we're going to jump into it because I want to only I want to get plenty of time for the for the end and the illustration there. Um, it was Thursday. Um, all of this stuff was out in in the building. So, with that being said, before you leave today, if we have some guys that could help tear that down and take that back out, that would be uh, fantastic. On Thursday, I was here, and I had Ellie, our five year old, with us. Um, and she was helping as best as she could. And I'm picking up as many pieces of that as what I can so I don't have to make multiple trips. You know, guys, when we go to the grocery store, what's the point of making five trips when you can pick it all up in one? Right? You have it all on your arm carrying in, and I had multiple pieces on my arms, and I'm grunting, and I'm sweating. And Ellie comes running in. I think Amber and Taylor were here, and she was like, Daddy needs help. He's very sweating. He's making a lot of noises. He needs help. <laughs> <laughs> but I got it done. All right, so the day, <laughs> the name of the sermon today is Stairway to Heaven. Where did, where did that title come from? Well, a few days ago, probably a week or two ago, I was reading, I was doing my daily reading, and I read this phrase in John 151 where it referred to Jesus as the stairway to heaven. And as I read that, the wheels immediately started turning, or as I like to, to refer, refer to it, when, when the Holy Spirit sermon juices start flowing, uh, you start taking notes or you get, you know, you're on your phone, on, you know, on your app, uh, putting notes and stuff in there. I can back up a little bit now. I'm not in danger of getting stuff dropped on my head. And I started immediately, the wheels started turning. And depending on what translation you're reading out of, it'll either refer, it'll have the phrase stairway to heaven, or it'll simply say, and we'll look at it in its entirety here in a moment. Jesus talks about how, you do, how you'll see uh, the angels uh, descending and ascending on the Son of Man. Yes. And depending on which uh, translation you're using, it also says it refers to the Son of Man being Jesus is the stairway to heaven. What that is referring to is Genesis 28, 12, when Jacob had his vision. And, and we'll, we'll uh, look at that as well here in just a moment. But when Jacob had that dream and he saw a ladder or a stairway, to heaven. And what Jesus is doing in the scripture we're going to look at here in just a moment is he is identi identifying himself as that bridge between the earthly and the heavenly things. How many of you are thankful that Jesus bridged the gap between us and the Father? Amen? So as I'm thinking about that, the stairway to heaven. See, the stairway to heaven that we're talking about today is about leveling up. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time to level up. I want you guys to realize that in a time of revival like we're in right now, or when God does something to you, when he, when he removes baggage from your life, when he breaks chains that have, that have had you bound, he doesn't do it for you to remain at the same level as what you were before that encounter. He does that, because how many of you guys know if you're weighted down with a bunch of weight, you can only climb for so long? 
Sometimes he's got to take stuff off of you. You see the thing right here. You can't see it now, but it says you have to give up to go up. That's actually, I think, the law of sacrifice from John Maxwell, if any of you are familiar with him. The law of sacrifice is you have to give up to go up. A lot of people may say, well, I wish I was in leadership. Well, you got to give up to go up. Right? The, the higher you go, the more responsibility do you have. The closer you get to Jesus, the more of you has to die. And here's the thing. A lot of people want the benefits of being up here, but they don't want to make the sacrifice necessary to make the climb. Yeah. You have to give up to go up. What is a stairway? I know it's, it's, duh, it's kind of obvious. It has stairs, right? But think about it for a moment. The definition, definition is actually one, of, one or more flights of stairs, usually with landings, to pass from one, from one level to another. If you think about it, if you're in a building or a hotel, you climb stairs and they take you to the next floor. You cannot get to that floor without the stairs. Now, I know you say, well, we have elevators today. Well, still, elevators, if you think about it, you got to cram all your luggage on there and everybody else is trying to, to get on the elevator and you got to move your luggage around. And sometimes when you cram everybody on there, it's smelly and it's crowded. And this morning, elevators are bad because they represent instant gratification. They represent a shortcut. Okay. This morning, we're talking about taking the stairs, but think about going to the next level. How many of you guys have ever played a video game? How many of you all still play video games? Don't be ashamed. Some of the adults put your hands up. There's nothing wrong with that. But you can't move on to the next level until you finish the previous one, right? You can't just go part way through and say, well, I just want to go to the next level. Well, you have to accomplish all the tasks on the level you're on before you go on to the next level. Without a stairway, you cannot advance to the next floor, the next level. But here's the thing. Sometimes climbing stairs take effort, Especially if it's, a, if it's a, a long stairwell, you get up and you're like, I thought I was in pretty good shape, but <laughs> I'm, I'm getting out of breath. Or sometimes the legs start burning, right? I know Friday we went uh, to the Perkins football game, go Pirates. They won again, go figure, doing good this year. But I, I had done a, a pretty hard workout that morning. My legs were already feeling it. And we went up and down several times, you know, you got to take your kid to the, to the bathroom and to the concession stand. And each time climbing up those, you start feel, feeling it in your legs a little bit. Climbing stairs take effort. And sometimes people just won't climb them because they don't want to put forth the effort. Sometimes people don't draw closer to God because they simply don't have the commitment to put forth the effort that it takes to get there. Sometimes we have to overcome resistance. And you think about it at a hotel, typically you prefer the lower floors, right? So that way you don't have to, if, remember, no, no elevators this morning. So you want the lower floors so you don't have to lug all of that luggage up to the top floors. But what if I told you you could experience something on the higher floors that you couldn't on the lower floors if you were willing to make the climb? As I was reading this, John chapter 1, a few, a few days ago, Again, that phrase, Jesus is the stairway to heaven, struck me and it gripped me. And the wheels started turning. And a little bit of backstory before we get into John chapter 1. Jesus was building his team. He was building his core 12. And Jesus is walking along. And John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer, as I like to call him, he had already, with some of his disciples around, when he saw Jesus, he already pointed and said, Look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He had, he had declared Jesus is the one that people had been waiting on. So this time when Jesus is walking by, two of John's disciples, Andrew and the other one is very likely uh, John. They leave John the Baptizer and they start following Jesus. And when, uh, and when Andrew starts following Jesus, he runs and gets his brother Simon, who we typically know as Peter. And he says, we found the Messiah. And he takes Peter with him. Well, the next day it says that Jesus finds Philip. And he tells Philip, come follow me. And then Philip runs and gets his friend Nathaniel. And he says, hey, we found the one that Moses and the prophets were talking about. Because here's what happens. When you encounter God, when you encounter Jesus, you have to go tell someone what happened and say, you got to come see him. The same with some of you have been doing that when you found out the revival was extended one more week. You're like, good. I've been inviting people. They haven't come yet. But if they said if we extended another week, they were going to be here. And I've heard many of you talking about, I'm inviting my, my friends, my family, whoever I see at work, I'm inviting them to church. Because why? Because you've experienced something that you want others to experience the same freedom and victory that you have experienced. 
When you encounter Jesus, you have to tell others about him. And that's the backdrop of these next five verses I'm going to read. John chapter 1, verse 47 through 51. It says, as they approached, this is talking about Philip and Nathaniel. Jesus said, now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. How do you know about me, Nathaniel asked. And Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Then Nathaniel exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. And Jesus asked him, do you believe this just because I told you I had seen you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Everybody say greater. Then he said, I tell you the truth, you will, see all, you will see all heaven, you will all see heaven open and the angels going up and down on the Son of Man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. So Jesus shows supernatural knowledge here with Nathaniel. He didn't see him physically, but he in the spiritual realm, he saw Nathaniel sitting under the tree. Now, many scholars and theologians uh, kind of speculate that Nathaniel, as he was sitting under that tree, he was reading Genesis chapter 28 about, the, the, about when Jacob saw the ladder or the stairway to heaven. And they think maybe that's why Jesus used that specific reference when Nathaniel and Philip came. But Nathaniel was blown away. I mean, think about it. If you have never seen someone and they tell you what you were just doing, it's going to get your attention. Right, The same way when uh, many, several times over the last couple of weeks, we've seen uh, the word of knowledge operate in a revival services where God will speak something um, to, in the services, it's been Nick or his team. Sometimes it happens here in our services at the altar or whatever. When someone says, hey, God is sharing this with me, it gets your attention because there's no way that they can know that about you without God revealing that to them. So Nathaniel is blown away and he declares, truly you are the Messiah. And Jesus says, are you impressed by this? Basically what he's saying is you ain't seen nothing yet. Because there's going to be something better. What, what could be better? Well, Jesus starts to go into it. He says, I tell you the truth. Or some of your Bibles may say truly, truly, or most assuredly. This phrase is not used outside of John in the New Testament. And anytime Jesus said it, he was always using it to draw your attention to a deeper truth. That phrase, truly, truly, it's in the original language, it's considered an emphasis marker that introduces a statement of, of high importance that's getting ready to come after it. So when they heard Jesus say, I tell you the truth, or truly, truly, it got their attention as it was designed to do. He says, you will see all of heaven open in the Son of Man, or the angels descending and ascending on the Son of Man. Now, when Jesus, why did he often refer to himself as the Son of Man? Well, basically what he was doing, he was claiming to be the Messiah when he called himself the Son of Man. It's a reference to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. And it tells us that Daniel saw someone like a Son of Man descending from the clouds. What that means is when you study that phrase in the Hebrew is Daniel saw in this vision in the clouds someone like a man coming. He looked like a man, but his origins were not of this earth. It was of heaven. He was, he was divine. We know Jesus was fully God and fully man. So every time Jesus called or referred to himself as the son of, son of man, he was claiming to be the Messiah. And if you think about it, Jesus never had his humanity questioned in the New Testament. But his divinity was constantly questioned by the people who didn't believe. Everybody believed, yeah, he's human. He looks just like you and me. And people were often uh, offended. I was reading this morning when he was doing miracles and people were like, who is he? And they were offended because as far as they were concerned, he was born of man just like they were. They had grown up with him and like, who, who is this guy? Where does he get his authority to do this? But look at John chapter 1. Verses 1 through 5 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it, or literally did not overcome it. How many of you are thankful that whatever darkness is in this world cannot overcome the light that is within you and shining through you? Can you say amen? amen. Skip down to verses 11 through 14. It says, He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. It literally means to take hold of. 
But as many as received him or took hold of him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believed in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Verse 14, here's the game changer. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1.14, where it says, and the word became flesh, that's recognizing Jesus is the one that was being talked about in John chapter 1.1, 1, 1, where it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. See, all of these other false religions, it's all about earning your way to their so-called God. To, to, to hopefully you will be good enough. But guess what? God looked down and he said, you all are never going to be good enough to earn your way back to me. So I'm going to come down because I'm the only one that's good enough. And I'm going to make the way back to the Father. How many of you are thankful that we serve a God who brought heaven down to us so we could go back to him? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So some of your Bibles, depending on what you're reading, may actually say the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Basically means Jesus set up shop right in the midst of the people. See, back in ancient times, what a king would do, sometimes they would look out from their palace and they would look at their people. And if they wanted to go out and see what was going on amongst their people, they would have to disguise themselves. Why would they do that? Well, if a king went out where people could readily identify him, a couple things would happen. He would either be mobbed because everybody would be like, hey, the king is here, let's, let's get close to the king. Or if they didn't like him, they could assassinate him. So they, instead of dressing in the royal robes and the crown, they would put on common clothes and disguise themselves so nobody would recognize them when they went out among the people. But the thing is, is when they went back to the palace or to the throne, the people couldn't go back. Why? Because they weren't royalty. They didn't have access to the palace. They didn't have access to the throne where the king was. But see, Jesus, where it says he, he came to his own people, but they did not realize that they did not take hold of him. Jesus went back and ascended to his throne. But look, guess what he did, John 14, 6, when the disciples are like, well, where are you going? How, are, how, how do we know where to find you? And Jesus said, guys, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. So not only did Jesus disguise himself to come to earth as man, but when he went back, he provided a way. Because here's the thing, when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and we receive adoption into God's family, we are brought into the royal family of God. Therefore, we have access to the throne. Can you say amen? amen. He says, you will see the heavens opened. Why do the heavens need open? Because sin and disobedience lead to the heavens being closed over you. Or as one author says uh, when in a book about revival, disobedience leads to heaven of bra heavens of brass. Our prayers don't get through and the blessing of God doesn't come down. But yet obedience to his word and repentance opens up the heavens so that the blessings and the promises of God can once again flow to, flow to us. Our sin causes separation from God. See, the oneness and fellowship that we see Adam and Eve originally had in the beginning of Genesis was broken because of sin. But how many of you know God promised a redeemer? How many of you are thankful that God's grace and his love are greater than your sin? Yeah. The hold that Satan gains over you when you sin may be powerful, but the love of God and his grace is more powerful. Grace is not a license to sin, but it's an empowerment to live the life that God called you to live. He said, you'll see the angels descending and ascending. See, angels are ministering spirits. Last week, we looked at when Jesus was tempted for 40 days. And at the end of those 40 days, it says the angels came and they, they ministered to him. Angels carry out assignments and they minister to the saints. Jesus is the stairway. He is the bridge between heaven and earth. It is the finished work of Jesus on the cross to shed blood in the empty grave that redeemed and restored what was lost and made a way for us once again to have access to God. When Jesus referred to himself as a stairway to heaven, again, he was referencing Genesis 28, verse 12. I'm going to read this passage, Genesis 28, verses 10 through 22. This was when Jacob had an encounter with God. I want you to realize this today. Even if you were brought up in a Christian family, maybe your, your mom and dad, your grandparents had powerful encounters with God, you cannot live off of somebody else's encounter. You cannot live off of somebody else's faith. I was brought up, as I've told you guys, I've been in church since I was in the womb. But the time had to come when I had to own my own faith. 
I was saved at age six. But there were times growing up, when, when I think back on it, I, why did I go to church? It was, I didn't have a choice. <laughs> I woke up, oh, I'm tired today. That's fine, you can be tired of church, we're going to church. Now listen, I, I'm thankful for the standard that was set in our home. Now, you can go out and hang out with friends, you can be out late, but Sunday morning comes, you're still gonna get up, you're still gonna go to church. But there had to come a time, I remember Jane, I don't remember the exact day that I was saved, but I remember the day because there was, there was a time where I, I drifted. I knew that I was running from what God had called me to do. And I remember going into church January 1st, 2006. I didn't know what the altar call was gonna be. I knew whatever it was, I was supposed to be there. Because God was saying it was time, it's time to rededicate yourself and get serious with me. And I remember kneeling at that altar. It was like right around in here, Cornerstone Community Church in Buchanan. Nick's been there several times. I remember going up to the altar and kneeling and saying, God, if you're still willing to use me, I'm ready. The most powerful, probably the most powerful encounter with God that I've ever had. I've had several that were close, but I think you know, that was the day that I received. I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt God was calling me in the full-time ministry. That was the day where I owned my faith. It became personal. I was no longer just going through the motions because that's what I was told to do or the way I'd been raised, but it's because I had personally encountered God and owned my faith for myself. And this was Jacob's encounter here. It says, meanwhile, Jacob left Beersheba and traveled toward Haran. At sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp and stop there for the night. Jacob found a stone to rest his head against and lay down to sleep. As he slept, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from the earth up to heaven. And he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father the God of your grandfather Abraham and the God of your father Isaac. The ground you were lying on belongs to you. I'm giving it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions, to the west and the east, to the north and the south, and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. What's more, I am with you. Everybody say, God is with you. I am with you and I will protect you wherever you go. One day I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have finished giving you everything I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I wasn't even aware of it. But he was also afraid and said, what an awesome place this is. It is none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. The next morning, Jacob got up very early. He took the stone he had rested his head against and he set it upright as a memorial pillar. Then he poured olive oil over it. He named that place Bethel, which means house of God, although it was previously called Luz. Then Jacob made this vow, if God will indeed be with me and protect me on this journey, and if he will provide me with food and clothing, and if I return safely to my father's home, then the Lord will certainly be my God. And this memorial pillar I have set up will become a place for worshiping God, and I will present to God a tenth of everything he gives me. That was Jacob's personal encounter. The first, the, the first time he truly and powerfully encountered God, it was no longer just what his, his grandfather Abraham had told him. It was no longer just what his father Isaac had told him. He had his own personal encounter with God. And when he got up that next morning, why did he set up the memorial? It was to remember. Every time he passed through that place, he would remember that encounter that he had with God. I want to encourage you all with this. If you've been a part of the revival the last couple of weeks, or not just these last couple of weeks, but any time you encounter God, if you don't journal, start journaling, do something to write it, do something to remember what God has done. Because there will be times in life where you need to remember the faithfulness of God. There's times in life where maybe you're, you're going through a hard time and you hear me say all the time, if God was faithful then, he'll be faithful now. And he's, if he's faithful now, he'll be faithful again. So this morning, what is your Bethel? That was the place he called Bethel. It means the house of God. It literally is, is also referring to anywhere God is present in a special way. So what are those Bethel moments where God has revealed himself to you in a real and tangible way? Those times, those, those moments that you can look back upon and it shows you the faithfulness of God. You look back on those moments and say, that is when my life was changed because God met me where I was in a real, tangible, and powerful way. It's vital, and I would even say it's a necessity to remember the times when God has met you. 
when God has been faithful. We say it's, it's more than just words on the screen. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. That's who he is. And we remember all those times. It helps us get through maybe the other hard times or the times where Satan tries to, to make us doubt in our mind or we're facing a trial in life. When we look back at those memorials that we have put up to help us remember what God has done, it reminds us of his faithfulness and it gives us the strength we need to go to that next level he is calling us to. Jesus is the bridge between heaven and earth. He and he alone is our redemption and victory. Jesus is the bridge. Here's the thing. All of mankind longs to discover this truth. Now, you may say, well, how can you look at the world and say that all of mankind longs to discover the truth of who God is? When you look at what's going on around the world, we see what began unfolding a couple days ago in Israel. You see what they're trying to do in this country and in culture and in society. How can you say, Pastor, that all of mankind longs to discover this truth? You've heard me say many times that circumstances are real, but they don't always tell the whole story. Ecclesiastes 3.11 talks about God has planted eternity in the human heart. Look at your neighbor and say, God has planted eternity in you. What does that mean? God has planted eternity in the hearts of man. What is eternal life? John chapter 17, Jesus says, I have come that they may have eternal life. And in John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That, uh, that word to know, as you see out on the wall out there, is part of our mission here at New Life, to help people know God. That's the first step of our mission. It's talking about a personal, firsthand, and intimate experience and walk with God. God has put a longing in the human heart that can only be fulfilled by him. How do I know that all of mankind longs for this? That's the, the reason that we might think that they, that they don't long for that is actually the exact reason that tells us they do. Why is the world, why are the lives of people so messed up and so broken? Because they're searching for something that can only be fulfilled by God. And when they don't find it in one thing, they keep going deeper and deeper and deeper down the wrong path, trying to find something that only God can give. Yeah. It's easy to look at people and say, well, they don't want God. Actually, they do. They're just looking for him in all the wrong places. It's easy to write someone off and say, well, they, they don't have any desire for God. It's actually the opposite. They have a desire. They may, in all actuality, they may not just realize who they're actually desiring. Maybe they need someone to take the time to see beyond their baggage and take the time to share the gospel with them, to share the love of God, to share what God has done in your life. Because how many of you used to be those people? How many of you are where you are today because someone took the time to step into your mess and to tell you about a heavenly father that loves you? He loves you just where you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay where you are. Can you say amen? See, since the beginning of time, mankind has been searching and trying to find fulfillment our own way. Look at Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. What did they say? Come, let us build ourselves a city whose top is in the heavens. They wanted to make a name for themselves. How did that work out for them? Not very good. They wanted to, to make a name for themselves. They wanted to bring glory to themselves. And you know how, how that uh, story plays out. God came down and he disrupted their efforts and they, they were driven to different parts of the earth and he, he confused their speech. That's actually why we have so many different languages around the world. You can trace it back to Genesis chapter 11. Look in the New Testament with the religious leaders and the teachers of the law, adding all of the man-made traditions to the law of Moses that God gave to Moses. And they actually held more tightly to the, the things they added to the law than they did the law of Moses itself. People in scripture, this blows my mind every time I think about it. We read in scripture that people made man-made images as idols. They put them on the shelf and they bowed down and worshiped them. Think about how crazy that is for a second. The creator is greater than the created, right? We know God is the creator. He is high and exalted above all. If I make something, if I carve something with my hands, am I more powerful than that or is it more powerful than me? 
I'm more powerful because I created it, right? So if I get into a situation where I'm like, I, I, need, I need someone to intervene, I need someone to help me through this, why would I bow down to something that I made with my own hands? If I can't get out of the situation, how is that going to help me? There's no life in that. There's no power in that. And I know we can read that and be like, that's, that's crazy, that's ridiculous. But the truth is that people today bow down to things made by man all the time. Maybe it's the devices that we have in our, in our back pocket. Mine's on the chair over there. Maybe it's the accolades of man. Maybe it's that promotion. Maybe it's, it's whatever. And none of these things are bad in and of themselves. But when we elevate those and we're trying to find our fulfillment and our worth in those things, we have elevated that and it's become an idol and a God rather than the one true God. Jesus, again, John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus said again in, in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, enter by the narrow gate. Everybody say narrow. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. See, the word way here in the Greek, it means a way or a road or a journey. Why do many people find the narrow way or the, the, the wide way? Because it's easier. It doesn't take sacrifice. It doesn't take surrender. It doesn't take effort. You can just go with the flow because that's what uh, everybody else is doing. Here's the difference. The Broadway says you do you, you live however you want, believe whatever you want, you live your own truth. But the narrow way says this, there is one truth and that truth has a name and his name is Jesus. He and he alone is the way to heaven and scripture says that one, there is one name under heaven which you must be saved. There is one name under heaven which every knee will bow and tongue confess that he is Lord and that name is what? Jesus. It's the narrow way. But people say, well, that's not fair. I get annoyed by that phrase if I'm being, if I'm being honest. It's not fair. I want to do it my way. Why do I have to do it according to the Bible? That's, it's not fair. Here's what's not fair. Can I just use an example? You, you don't have to get up yet because you're going to have to get up to make sure I don't kill myself here a little bit. Imagine that I, I committed a, a capital offense of some sort and I'm on trial. And the verdict is given and it's guilty and it comes with a death penalty. But as the judge is delivering the verdict, he says, but actually, you're not going to die. He points to you out in the crowd and says, you're going to die. Is that fair? And you would protest, right? Your family would protest. But that's exactly what happened with the cross is we committed the, the, the sin that leading to death. And instead of us receiving the death penalty, Jesus steps in. And he was the one, according to Isaiah 52, 14, that was beaten beyond human recognition. So if we want to talk about what's not fair, the fact that what happened to Jesus is what's not fair. But because of the love he has for us, we're the ones that if we place our faith in, in him, that we get off free because he took the punishment of our sin upon himself. So this whole thing about what's not fair it doesn't stand up. Yes. See, mankind has and always will pursue a way to fulfill a longing in their heart. We have a hunger and a longing in our heart that is only found in one place, and that's in the center of God's presence and his will. We used to sing a song, Take Me In. Anybody know that song? Especially if you heard the Cutlass version, all the guitars. I'm a guitar fan. But it says, take me in. It says, take me past the outer courts. See, the outer courts is where the common people could come and gather. It says, take me past the priests that sing your name. Because see, the next thing, the priests would be performing some of the religious ceremonies. You couldn't get in if you weren't part of the priesthood. But even beyond that was the inner court or the holy of holies. And only the high priest that I think was, was once a year, could go into the Holy of Holies. But before they could do that, they had to go through this whole ritual cleansing. They had to wash and, and be clean. There couldn't be a speck of dirt on their bodies or on their clothing. Why? Because it was showing the same thing that is required to enter the presence of God, perfection. And that's what the blood of Jesus does. But the priests, when, they, when the high priest would go in, they would tie a rope around their, their ankle or, or their foot because if there was any uncleanness found on them, they would be struck dead in the presence of God. 
And when that happened, the people would have to pull them out by the rope. But this song talks about, take me past the outer courts. Take me past the priests who sing your name. I hunger and thirst for your righteousness, and it's only found in one place. So take me in to the Holy of Holies. And you may say, well, how can I go into the Holy of Holies if I have to be perfect? If I'm not perfect, I die. You have to be covered in the blood. And you have to say, when it's saying, I'm not interested with all the fluff in the outer courts, all the people just going through the motions, I will lay down, surrender whatever I have to give to be able to live my life and experience the presence of God. That's the only place where that longing in your heart is going to be fulfilled. But the closer you get to Jesus, the more of you has to die. See, a stairway was meant to be climbed one step at a time. There are floors and levels that the stairway lead to that you can't get to, you can't get to without going up the stairway. But the problem is many people want the blessings of God without God himself. Many people want a savior, but not a Lord. The difference is, save me. Save me from my mess. Save me from my sin. But God, I still want to do life my own way. That's not how it works. Why, when we're talking about being a Christian, why, when we pray, I say, Lord and Savior. Everybody wants to be bailed out. But Jesus is your Lord means I'm surrendering my life to you. I'm doing things your way. I'm allowing you to call the shots. But too many people in the world, and many times even in the church, want the Savior, they want the benefits without surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus. See, each level, if the people helping me save my life here in a little bit want to come on up. <laughs> Y'all think I'm kidding, but if you know how much I dislike unsecured heights, you know I'm really not kidding. <clears throat> each level and season of life serves a purpose. But before you can go on to the next, you have to leave one behind. There's a lot of people that are like, well, the way things used to be. Now, I'm, I'm not dissing the way things used to be. You should remember what God has done for your life in previous seasons, what he has done in the church. But if you stay there, you miss out on what God is wanting to do now. I'm thankful for all the things I learned growing up in church. But listen, I'm not living in the 90s anymore. I was born in the 80s. I'm not living in the 80s or the 90s or the early 2000s. This is 2023, and God is wanting to do a fresh new work in the church and in the lives of each and every believer. You don't forget the past. You remember it to remember the goodness and the faithfulness of God. But you have to continue upward as you climb to the next level. Oh, dear God. <laughs> I wrestled with God a, a little bit this week. I'm like, you know, I could just set it up and I could talk through it. I felt God be like, well, you can do whatever you want. But if you actually get on the scaffolding, it's going to help illustrate the point a little bit better. Because I love you all and I want you to get the fullness of this illustration. That's higher than what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Lord Jesus, I'm stalling a little bit. I got I to gotta collect myself here. But listen, in all fairness, I've actually fallen through the scaffolding before. It was about right here at the old place. I'll tell this and I get, then I got to get going with the illustration. It's when we were painting the youth room at the old church. And it was one day during the week and I was doing some touch up and my wife Liddy was there with me. And I think this level was probably like up around here and there was paint on the ladder beside of me and I was getting ready to step off and right about when I got here, see, I didn't have these things. Uh, apparently these things weren't fastened um, very well. And when I stepped about right here, this kicked out and I fall through and skin my leg up and bruise my arm. It was so loud that the secretary of the church comes running in and she says, are you okay? What happened? I'm like, I'm fine. I'm in pain, but I'm fine. See, here's the thing. We have baggage in life, right? See, I do, I, I do luggage the same way that I do groceries. I, I uh, get as much as I can when we're packing up to go on a trip. My wife's like, hey, I got a couple bags ready. I was like, nope, get them all out here. And... Uh, I'll take them all out when I'm ready, when you got them all. <laughs> See, this is what we look like in life sometimes, right? 
if we could see spiritually, we get all this stuff. And it may not be bad stuff, but we have to understand there's a difference between what is good and what is holy. And sometimes God is saying, the things in your life may not actually be bad, but if you want to go to the next level in your walk with me, you've got to be willing to give something up. How many of you have ever flown before? How many of you guys know there's a limit on the amount of, ba- the amount of baggage that you can have, right? So if you're going to climb, sometimes you've got to give baggage up. I'm going to give that one up because that's the heaviest. And see, I could just say, well, I'm just going to throw... I just want to throw everything here, and that way I can take everything. But remember, narrow is the gate, right? The only way is up the ladder. So I'm going to switch around here. I show, I show up, and someone said, you didn't wear the right shoes. And I said, no, I didn't. But you only live once, right? So if I'm going up, if you let me fall, you're fired. <laughs> Y'all think I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. So, to get here, I can maybe at first. My palms are really. That's why it's not good to take baggage with you. <laughs> See, I can get to this level of baggage, right? I'm just going to take a knee for a second. <laughs> it's, not, it's not too bad yet. But the thing is, if you think about a hotel or, 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 or a, an apartment complex. When you get up to your floor, that's where you do life. Maybe that's where you have relationships. That's where you connect. That's, that's where you grow. But then God calls you higher. But remember, you have to give up to go up. And the thing is, the higher up you go, the smaller the crowd gets. Because not as many people are willing to give up the baggage. But you have to take an inventory of your life and say, what's more important? Again, it may not be be necessarily bad, but maybe to experience the fullness of what God has, you have to empty some stuff that may be good, but not necessarily completely holy. Sometimes we settle. I think somewhere I saw, uh, it was in a book I read, I think, There's a difference between what is good and what is God. There's times that maybe it's not a sin, but God is saying, I want you to give it up. Maybe, I think you shared in week one, it was football for you. To me, I started off in college as a music education major. Did that for two years. God said, no, I'm calling you to to Bible school. See, the thing is, sometimes when God calls us in a new direction, we can kind of be like, well, the last season of my life was an absolute waste of time. What, what purpose was that? But see, God is working in ways that you don't realize. I remember when I first left uh, the school I was at, 100% job placement for the music department. If you graduate with a music ed degree and you're willing to move, you are getting a job right out of school. And I remember when I left and was, took a year off and was, then I was doing Bible school and trying to figure out what I was doing and not being exactly sure where God was leading, there were many times I was like, those two years were a complete waste of time. I have two years worth of student debt. My friends now are getting hired. They're doing all this stuff. It was a waste of time. But guess what? I would not have gotten hired here without a background in music. They weren't just looking for a youth pastor. They were looking at someone with a music background to help build a youth band and also help lead worship, I think once or twice a month or whatever it was. Those two years were not a waste of time. I could not have ended up here without those two years. So don't think just because you don't, really see or perceive what God is doing in this current season or what he did in the season, he is getting ready to bring you into something that you couldn't have done if you were not faithful in that season. But see, it then gets to the point where God is calling you higher and you say, okay, I'm going to go. And he says, it's too much baggage. You got to leave some of it behind. Now, so I can take this because it's light.
Wow. <laughs> Y'all look good. I don't feel good, I'll tell you that. But see, then you get up here. Here's the thing, the higher you go, the more your perspective changes. When I was down there, I was looking all right at your faces. Now I get up here and I see a different perspective. The higher you go, he's taking a picture. The higher you go, I have to joke to keep myself relaxed, okay? The higher you go, you start seeing things more from God's perspective. And the higher you go, the closer you get to him and the further away you are from where you used to be. The closer you get to him, you're like, well, why would I want to go back? Satan may try to say it would be easier if you would just go back down. But I got to tell you, I'm not looking forward to going back down. He tries to make you believe, is it really worth it to climb? The answer is yes. It will be scary. Your palms may get sweaty as you're trying to climb. Sometimes you may even slip. Why do you have to give the baggage up? Because when you slip, the more baggage that you have or that when you walk through a trial in life or Satan tries to, 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 to attack you, if you have all that baggage, you're carrying all that weight and it's a lot easier to get tripped up. I like watching this, this uh, one show on YouTube from the History Channel. It's called Dog Fights. Has anybody ever seen that? It goes through like the different wars and how the different like fighter jets have evolved. And uh, I just, I like watching the fighter jets and, the, and the, the battles and all that stuff. But one thing that's very interesting, when they were getting ready to go into a dog fight where they knew they were gonna have to outmaneuver the enemy, they would get rid of their exterior fuel tanks. Why? Because it was unnecessary weight. And as the enemy aircraft came, if they were weighed down by all that extra weight, the enemy would be able to outmaneuver them and to go faster than them. So what did they have to do? They had to shed the baggage. The same thing when we're going higher in life, sometimes we have to shed the extra weight because the, the thing is, when you're going higher with God, when you're walking with God, that is a spiritual battle. And Satan will try to take you out and you have to shed the baggage. What do I have to shed? It depends. Depending on where you are in life, it's something different. Maybe it's a new job. Maybe it's a new circle of friends. Maybe it's, it's starting a new ministry. Maybe it's stepping out in faith. I remember for us back in, when we moved, December 29th, 2013? Yeah. For, for us, I'd grown up in the same city my entire life. Went to my first two years of college in that same city. Started serving in the church part-time that I grew up in. And then when God says, you know, we, we thought we had found the church we were going to be at. They weren't looking at any other candidates uh, for a youth pastor. It just seemed like it was all God. It was right in the middle of all our family, you know, within probably an hour and a half, two hour drive. They were just finishing up a 15,000 square foot youth facility. To put that in perspective, this building is 17,000. So it was basically the same size as this. You know, great. It was a, it was a big church. And, uh, but we didn't have a piece about it. And then we came up here and God was like, that's the place. But I remember when we moved up here and you know, you're excited, full-time ministry, but then the time came, our families helped us move, but then the time came when our families were leaving. And then it hits. Everything that I've known, everything that has been familiar with me is, is gone. But see, here's the thing, if we wouldn't have made that move, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have gotten to adopt our beautiful now five-year-old daughter wouldn't have been your pastor, wouldn't have been experiencing this revival and walking in whatever God has next. See, the sacrifice is always worth it. It may not seem like it, but it's always worth it. And sometimes you think, hey, I've, I've gone up, I'm doing great, and then God says, it's time to go higher. I gotta make this quick, because I'm going, I'm going long this morning. But you grab this, and he says, no, 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 no. This one, you gotta give up everything. How I many of you know if you want all of God, he's got to have all of you? Amen. Amen. Oh, dear God. <laughs> I'm going to shed the jacket on this one. No, uh, no unnecessary baggage or hang -ups. These are the moments when your prayer life goes to another level. I trust you. I'm 
saying that is I'm climbing to drive myself to the judge thing. <laughs> but I, I've got to say, can you guys hear me without the mic? Yeah. The thing is, is once we come out of a out of a revival, or come out of a place where God is calling you. <laughs> Coming out of a revival, and when God is calling you into a new season, this is where you are. You're not on the floor that represents the past, but you haven't got to where he's going. Sometimes you're in these in-between seasons where you're not on either place, and it's in those moments when you have to trust God. It's in those moments when the enemy can try to make you doubt. Because you're not looking at the past, but you haven't got to you can't see what is next. When the time is right, God is going to show you what he has for you next. Can you say amen? amen. It's almost there. I still got to go down, though. That's the bad part. <laughs> I want to sit down for just a second. <laughs> Actually, this will be a good time for the worship team to come back up. <laughs> But see, the, the thing is, when we're talking about seeing the ladder that Jacob saw, the scripture says that he saw God at the top. When you keep climbing, the closer you get to him. The closer you get to him, the more that you trust. You don't think so much about the things that used to be because the closer you get to God, the things that used to be don't seem as important anymore. The things that maybe you thought you would miss, you don't miss because the more of God you've experienced, you realize that there's truly nothing that's better than him. Like that song we sang a little bit ago, Graves in the Garden. The closer you get to him, the more you trust. The closer you get to him, the more like him that you look and that you, the, the more like him that you live. There may not be near as many people up here, but for all the people that may be left behind because they're not willing to climb with you, God will always replace those people. He'll always, there's been many times when God has called me into something new, people didn't want to go, but he always brought new people to replace the people that didn't want to make the climb. I remember when Lydia and I started in the ministry back in Buchanan. And there were people and friends we had at, at the college that we met at. Um, it was like we fell off the face of the earth. We were still the same people. We were just obeying God. I remember there they would uh, be times where the only way we knew they had come back in town after everybody had graduated is we would see them posted on Facebook. And we were like, what's the deal? But the deal is, is the higher you go, if people, because the, the higher you go, the closer you get to God and the more of you has to die. If people don't want parts of their lives to have to die, they won't be willing to make the climb with you. But God will surround you with people who are willing not just to make the climb, but to be there like these guys were to make sure I don't fall or to be there to reach their hand out and help pull me up when I'm starting to doubt. If you'll stand with me this morning. It's time to descend the ladder. I have to keep it lighter all three years. 